Hello, I am Drew Davis. We're here at Lipscomb University with Dr. Dennis Lloyd, a longtime professor at Lipscomb University. Can you tell us what years you were at Lipscomb University? Uh, as a student or as a faculty member? As or a both. faculty member. Faculty member, I came to Lipscomb to teach in the fall of 1959. I retired in 2001. 1959 to 2001, and mm -hmm. you were in the English department? First eight years I taught in the high school. I came to teach in the high school, and then when I finished my doctorate, then I went to the college. And you're also dean of students. I was dean of students for about 12 years in there. I was still teaching even though I was in the administration, but uh, yeah. So you, you saw Lipscomb go through a lot of changes over those years. Yeah, they saw me go through some changes too. <laughs> From David Lipscomb College to Lipscomb University. Mm -hmm. Quite a jump, quite a difference. Quite a jump, yes. Did you also attend Lipscomb, David Lipscomb College? I did. I attended Lipscomb High School and College. Oh, you did? So I really came to the campus in the fall of 1950 and was here until 2001. Where was home for you? Only you? a couple of years out. Uh, I grew up in Nashville. I grew up in South Nashville in what we what we uh, proudly called Woodbine. Old timers called it Flat Rock, but we thought Woodbine sounded better, so. Uh, now, did you always want to teach at Lipscomb? Um, yeah, pretty much so. Um, I, I was rather arrogant and said, uh, some of my friends were talking about applying, and I said, uh, I'm not going to apply. If they want me, they'll come get me. And did they? They did. <laughs> Who was the president at the time? Well, the president was Athens Clay Puyas. And did you, get, uh, did you have your master's degree? Uh, I got my master's along the way. I got my master's in 62 while I was teaching and then picked up an EDS and then a PhD. Where'd you get your PhD? All my graduate work was at Peabody. Peabody, uh, George mm -hmm. Peabody, okay. Did you, uh, and you were uh, an English major in college? I was an English major in college, speech minor, and um, had all, those, all that speech training. Never taught a day of speech in my life, but I uh, taught a lot of English. Did you... Uh, teach uh, English lit classes or? My work was primarily in American lit. American lit. Taught freshman English, which was a general uh, education course, and then American lit. The only thing in English literature I ever taught was after Dr. Landis retired, I took over the course in, in John Milton because uh, I had graduate work in Milton and I liked his work and so I taught our Milton class for the last few years that I so taught. So you were, you were teaching the classics? Yeah. Who are some of your favorite writers? Oh, well, I would have to start off with, you know, uh, early American writers, um, Hawthorne and Poe and, and Melville, uh, come on up through Mark Twain and, and Faulkner and, uh, you know, some of those folks, some of the classical writers. Uh, you, you, of course, you read a lot, fiction, nonfiction? Both. Yeah. Did Tried you ever do any writing yourself? Not... <laughs> Not in a serious vein, not to write a book or anything. I did a lot of um, articles uh, or uh, wrote papers for professional meetings. I read a number of papers over the years in professional meetings. But uh, we were visiting Faulkner's home um, in the late 60s. Our son was probably eight or nine years old, and he and I were wandering around out in the yard. And he said, who was this fellow? And I said, uh, he was a writer. And he said, like you? And I said, yeah, you keep thinking that. <laughs> so, uh, no, I was never that kind of writer. Did you also preach? Yes, I did. I, I started preaching when I was, while, while I was still in high school, actually, you know, preaching occasionally. And, uh, yeah, I continued to preach. Most of the time during those early years, I was preaching at, uh, in some rural churches. And I moved to Nashville for the Reed Avenue Church, uh, which was where David Lipscomb had gone to church at one time. Um, we were losing our property because of interstate construction. So when they hired me, I knew I'd only be there a couple of years. Then I worked at Brentwood Hills for a couple of years as their associate. And then I went to Green Street where I was for 14 years. And then I came to Granny White and preached for 10 years. And you still teach Sunday school there? Right? I still teach Sunday school. I'm one of the elders now at Granny White. How long have you been at Granny White? 30 years. Wow. So you've seen Lipscomb change a great deal. Uh, the church go through changes, and Nashville in general. No, Nashville in general is phenomenal. It's one of the fastest growing cities it in the is. United States. It is. Well, do you, you feel the growth is a positive thing? Or? I think generally, yes. You know, I'd like to have Besides less. Besides more traffic. I was, was going to say, I'd like to have less traffic on my road, and because uh, uh, we live on Woodmont Boulevard, and this is a major thoroughfare, and 
it's still a two-lane road and the traffic is just bumper to bumper most of the time. What did you enjoy most about teaching? Oh, um, not sure I could narrow it down to one thing. I always enjoyed my contact with my students. Uh, I liked that very much. I loved the subject matter that I was teaching. Um, I thought it was important and, and I derived a great deal of pleasure just from the rereading and restudying and, and representing uh, a poem or a short story or a novel. Uh, it was just fun for me. And how, did you, how did you enjoy your time as the Dean of Students? Uh, that's a mixed blessing. Um, again, I enjoyed the contacts. Uh, I had the advantage that um, uh, I not only dealt with discipline problems, which is what everybody thinks of immediately, but I also worked with student government. I worked with a social club system. Uh, I was involved in some other things too that gave me kind of the other side of the student body. And um, I thought it, I, I thought it was a good experience for me. I, um, there were some nights that I didn't want to get up at some ungodly hour because something was going on mm -hmm. that shouldn't have been going on. But uh, uh, otherwise, I, I, I thought it was a good experience. I will have to tell you that I served two different periods as Dean of Students. Uh, I went into that job, uh, Dr. McKelvey, who was my predecessor, said, you, you know, the national average for a Dean of Students is five years. Well, I served four years and decided I would go back to teaching because uh, I asked my son if it bothered him for me to be Dean of Students, and he said, you're never at home. Hmm. And I said, if I went back to full-time teaching, I'd be grading papers every night. He said, yes, but you'd be at home. Hmm. And so I went back to teaching. About three years later, Dr. McKelvey came to me and asked if I would reconsider and go back to the dean's office. And not because I was so unique, it's because nobody else would take the job. And uh, so I agreed. And um, one of my colleagues stopped me in the hall and said, you're going back to the dean of students' office? And I said, yes. And he said, when I heard that, the only thing I could think of was that verse in the Bible that talks about the dog returning to his vomit. <laughs> I told him I didn't think that was a very professional observation, but uh, that was kind of the perception. Tell us about your family life. Uh, my wife is Shirley. Uh, Shirley and I have been married for 58 years. Did uh, you meet her at Lipscomb? Hmm? Was she a Lipscomb no, student? No, she was a Lipscomb student, but I didn't meet her here. I, I met her elsewhere, but uh, she came to Lipscomb her, soft, her junior and senior years of high school. Uh, she was from East Nashville. Our father was an elder at the Trinity Lane Church on the other side of town. Uh, we met here, um, I guess we met in 56 and we married in 58 after I graduated. Um, I taught my first year with the Metro Public, with the Davidson County Public Schools. And that summer, I was asked to come teach summer school in the high school here. They, they had a pretty active summer school program and that's when the principal of the high school said, why don't you just come teach for us this fall? So. I got my invitation mm -hmm. I was looking for, so I stayed. Uh, we have three children. Uh, our oldest uh, child, uh, a daughter, teaches fifth grade at Lipscomb and has been teaching there for probably, I'd better not commit, but a good number of years. <laughs> uh, our second daughter uh, is, a, um, is a librarian who presently is just enjoying not working at all. Um, and then our son, uh, lives in Las Cruces, New Mexico, but uh, they all went to Lipscomb. How many grand grandkids? Well, that's an interesting figure now. Uh, for a good number of years, we had three grandchildren. Uh, each daughter had, uh, each daughter had, well, one daughter had one child, the other had two children. They're all grown now. Um, the daughter of our, our oldest grandchild is also an English teacher uh, in the Metro School, so we've kind of carried on this business of teaching English. Uh, our son recently, in the last th three years, last three years, has married a lady who already had three children. So our number of grandchildren doubled immediately from three to now six, and now they are expecting a child. So mm. at our adv advanced years, we're, we're getting more grandchildren. That's wonderful. Something this I is expecting. the 125th anniversary yeah. of Lipscomb University. Looking backwards, Lipscomb University has always attracted good educators, good leadership, good people. How do you account for that? Well, I certainly think the church has a lot to do with it. Uh, people are, were concerned with a, a kind of um, commitment, I think, to, uh, to uh, wasn't just a teaching job, it was Christian education. Mm -hmm. uh, I will mention in connection with the anniversary, my freshman year of high school, 
school year 51 was the 60th anniversary of the school. And we had a lot to do that year honoring mm -hmm. the 60 years of the history of, of Lipscomb. So uh, I've sort of moved now to the 125th year. Uh, you were so well read. Did you read uh, a lot of the original works of David Lipscomb? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And some of the early founders. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you were going on vacation, a long vacation, you could only bring one book with you. What would that book be? <laughs> if you ask somebody who has a library of <laughs> hundreds of books, well, obviously I'd take a Bible uh, because that's, that's essential uh, for daily reading. Um, oh, I don't know. I'd probably take some Faulkner. It takes a long time to get through him, and he's fun. Your, uh, your, your teaching at Lipscomb, you saw uh, many generations come through. Did you notice any, perceive any changes from one decade to the next in students? No, I really didn't. I, the interesting thing is that I would see some differences from one year to the next. Mm. Some groups of students just really seemed to have a, a camaraderie that they worked well together, and the next group might be more fragmented. And, and we used to talk about that some in, in staff meetings, but I, my freshman section this year just can't get it all together. Mm -hmm. Last year's section was great. And um, one of the problems with that, and I, I read a book years ago by G.B. Harrison called The Profession of English, and Harrison says in his book, one of the problems with English teachers is that every year they get a new crop of students who know a great deal less than the ones they turned loose the previous spring. Hmm. The teacher has continued to add to his storehouse of knowledge, and the more years he teaches, the farther away from him the students get. Which I thought was a very interesting observation yes. because he was right. And sometimes I think, you know, but I just taught this last year, but they weren't in the class last right. year. Right. And they haven't learned that. And so it's awfully tempting to say, well, they're just not as bright as the group I had last year. But I'd had them the whole year to teach some things that I thought were important. So obviously social changes make a difference and that kind of thing. But by and large, students are students. When you were teaching at Lipscomb, who were some of the names in English department or other departments that you were there during your time? Oh, well, because I, I think I came along at a, at a golden era for Lipscomb. Uh, with people like, like Dr. Baxter and, and Carol Ellis and Tom Whitfield, Axel Swang, um, Howard White, J.P. Sanders, Matt Craig. You know, those are the people that I connected with. Um, Carol was a, an amazing speech teacher. Um, Morris Landis was my mentor, uh, both as a, as a student and as a faculty member. He was my department chairman. Uh, Dr. Landis could be very difficult at times, as many of his students would attest, but he was also a lot of fun, and um, I enjoyed working with him. Sue Berry was teaching in the English department um, when I was still a student. She came while I was a student, began her career, and then, of course, we worked together. And uh, She was chairman of the English department for a while after Dr. Landis stepped down, and then uh, she, went, she became director of teacher education, and I became chairman of the English department in her position, so we, we all kind of worked together. Um, I thought it was a good faculty. Uh, they, were, they were good to me as a student. They were good to me as colleagues. Um, it was a good experience. Now this year would, would have been Dr. Baxter's 100th birthday. Birthday, right. Tell us some more about him as a person and a, a fellow faculty member. When I was a college freshman, all the classes had to have class sponsors. And two, of the, two or three of us went to see him to ask him if he would be our class sponsor. We were gonna get a little prestige. I mean, you, you could get Dr. Baxter, that's Barry Baxter, you know. And he just explained to us, he just really did not have time to do that. And truthfully, would not have had much interest in sponsoring a freshman class, but was very encouraging. Um, I had only one class with him. I had preparation delivery of sermons with Dr. Baxter. Uh, it was a great class. Um, not long ago, in going through some old papers, I found my evaluation form where I had preached a sermon and he had filled out my evaluation form. And I was kind of glad to find it. it I, did, I did okay. But um, I, I know of no other person probably on this faculty who was more widely respected than mm -hmm. he was. Um, he had been the preacher at the church where my wife grew up. And um, 
preached at Trinity Lane for several years, and she knew the Baxters well. In fact, knew them better than I did. Uh, I knew him strictly as my college prof. Uh, she knew him as her preacher, mm -hmm. so she had a better association with. Uh, I didn't know Mrs. Baxter very well at all until many, many years later. But uh, he was a he was a phenomenal person. He was a great encourager. Uh, which uh, I appreciated, uh, particularly those times when he encouraged me. Uh, you're also involved in the Gospel Advocate magazine. Mm -hmm. What do you do with them? I'm the associate editor. I've been at the Advocate for 20 years. I started there before I retired. Uh, Neil Anderson, who owned the company, had been after me. Neil and I had been students together at Lipscomb back in the 50s. Neil kept trying to get me to come, and, and I just said, I can't come until I retire. But um, we worked out an arrangement where I would go maybe a couple of afternoons a week and spend a couple of hours over there doing some reading and editing and so forth. And then when I retired, uh, I went, I didn't jump into it full time. I go three days a week and um, I do a, read all the articles that come in, uh, read most of the manuscripts for book publication, I do some editing, do some writing myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been a good relationship. Um, Neil sold the company this past spring, uh, April of 2016. We have new owners now, and uh, I'm, they, they seem to want me to stay, so I'm still there. Now, is uh, Greg Tidwell? Is Greg still Tidwell the is the editor. Greg lives in Columbus, Ohio. So Another I, Lipscomb graduate. Another Lipscomb grad. Was in school with one of our daughters. Um, we communicate with email and with telephone calls, and uh, when he gets his articles together for a month's issue, he sends them all to me, and I read them and then pass them on for further editing. But, uh, yeah, we have a good working relationship. Uh, the, the students that come out of Lipscomb seem like they, they do so well in their field of work or vocation, whether it's uh, education or ministry or business mm -hmm. or the medical world that sort of thing. Uh, do you feel like, like, what are the advantages of Lipscomb University? Uh, what do they have that allows them to pr produce such a, a well-rounded, productive alumni? Again, I'm gonna come back to the relationship between faculty and students. Um, when I, the, for my first year to teach, as I said, I taught in public schools. And uh, I was in a brand new school. It was only in the third year of its existence. Um, I tried to start a fledgling forensics program there because I was, I've always been interested in forensics, uh, teaching debate and, and um, individual um, events and so forth. And I said something to one of the longtime teachers there that my wife and I, and we just lived in a small apartment, but I said, we're going to have our debaters over for dinner one night. And she said, now don't start that foolishness here. I don't want my students to even know where I live, much less inviting them to my house. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't handle that because I went through Lipscomb where I was frequently in faculty members' homes. Mm -hmm. I was welcome, personal, I was in touch. personal ties. And I think that's had a lot to do mm -hmm. with uh, maybe developing a kind of earlier sense of security and, and uh, yeah, I can do this. A because sense they, of family, yeah, community, sense right. of community. And here's some people who really believe in me and they're, they're helping me. I, I, don't, I can't prove that. I just think that's a factor. Mm -hmm. What are some of your best memories at Lipscomb and some of your not best memories at Lipscomb? Oh, among my best memories probably would be Beautiful Day, uh, which some people can't even believe we ever did such a foolish thing, but uh, it was fun. You know what I'm talking about? No, what is okay. Beautiful Day? Sometime in, uh, in the 1950s, and it carried on over into the 60s. Started in the college and then the high school added it on. Brother Collins would just get up one day in the spring and announce today's a beautiful day. And all classes were canceled. There were buses waiting for us and we all went out to one of the Warner Parks. Really? And we had a picnic and we played games and we just enjoyed the whole day. What a great idea. Uh, we had a student body president who ran, uh, uh, part of his ticket was that in the winter quarter we were going to have a, a dreary day. We're, uh, what are you talking about? Dreary day, I believe it was. The only problem was with a dreary day was you had to come to chapel to find out it was a beautiful day. And if you're going to get up and trudge through the ice and snow to get to chapel, you might as well stay. Right. right. You know, it wasn't like you can go out to the park and have fun. Uh, I wanted to know dreary day the day before, so I didn't have to get up. Mm -hmm. 
but that one never did work. But Beautiful Day went on for quite a while, and then it got to be such a standard thing. The students started, uh, uh, they'd call the bus company to see if any buses had been re reserved by Lipscomb, and they'd check out various things, and a lot of them just stopped going. They, they'd take the day off and just shop right. or do right. it, you know. So, and the school got bigger and bigger, and it was just harder to manage that, but that was a great memory. Mm -hmm. And um, we just had a good time. And I, I think, it, again, it said, they were interested in us as people. Right. We needed to develop the some whole person. social skills as well as academic skills. So that'd be one of my memories. I mean, of course, anybody who's ever been to Lipscomb will have to attest to the fact that chapel is a good memory. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were some days that I didn't like chapel. Uh, I thought it was dull and dreary, but uh, overall it was a good experience. Probably disliked it more the days I had to preside in chapel than mm -hmm. any other time, because then I was always conscious of what was going on that shouldn't be going on. Um, Any difficult times at Lipscomb that come to mind? Well, there were discipline problems when I was in the Dean of Students office, when I had to deal with students that um, I was disappointed in and, and, and their behavior and what they had wound up doing. And, and yet even some of those, um, I wound up doing a wedding ceremony for a couple I'd kicked out of school <laughs> who came back and said, we want you to do our wedding. Wow. Which I, th I thought said something about our relationship um, so, um, but those, some of those were, were less than pleasant, mm -hmm. but we survived and, and they did too. Um, something that I, I've always wondered about is cultural societal changes from say the late 1950s through the 1960s were such a time of upheaval, change, yeah. social change, counterculture, hippies, the Vietnam War, Richard Nixon resigns. Mm -hmm. uh, those type of change, the drug culture, that sort of thing. Yeah. I always wondered how Dave Lipscomb College at that time maneuvered through those difficult years. We really got through a lot easier than a lot of schools did, uh, understandably. But uh, we had we had our rough moments, and there were times when, uh, you know, I, I didn't know anything about drugs, but I had to learn something about drugs. I, I remember a student coming in to, that, that I knew really well. Uh, telling me one day that his head resident had walked in his room and they'd been smoking pot and the head resident didn't smell it and didn't know what it was. And I said, he shouldn't have to know what it was. Mm -hmm. You know, the student was proud because he got away with it. I wanted him to know that we shouldn't have to deal with that, but we did. And, mm -hmm. and there were times when I would search somebody's room and find marijuana and we had to deal with that. Um, but not, not to the proportion that we heard about or read about on lots of campuses. Lipscomb was a little bit more insulated yeah, than other yeah. universities. Always accused of being sheltered. I don't think we were that sheltered, but we insulation may be a better word for it. But uh, How about th some of the changes over the decades in the church that you noticed? Well, of course, I, I, there are some changes in the church that I, I'm not really fond of. And, and uh, um, as is typical with people as they get older, as I've gotten older, there are some things that I think we didn't need to go there. We, we were doing all right without that. But uh, uh, and I'm, I'm grateful always for continuing, pe people continuing to go to church, continuing to be interested. And um, we learned to live with some of those. What are your uh, favorite, do you have a favorite book in the Bible, favorite verses in the Bible? If I, if I said to you, uh, Dr. Lloyd, so-and-so just called me, they're sick, you have to go preach, and you have five minutes notice. What would you preach on? <laughs> I like Philippians a lot. Our son was in Desert Storm, and I got to talk to him one night, and he was so depressed, and I said, are you reading your Bible? And he said, yeah, I'm reading Ecclesiastes. I said, get out of Ecclesiastes and go to Philippians. You don't need to be in Ecclesiastes mm -hmm. when you're depressed. Mm -hmm. Uh, so Philippians has always been a, a very special book for me. Um, I like First and Second Timothy. I, I think they're uh, they're just very valuable books. I like Acts because it's historical. So um, I don't know which book I preach from more often. Um, I still like a lot of Old Testament sermons. Uh, some of the Old Testament stories are great. And right now, on, on Sunday morning, I'm teaching the Book of Numbers, which is uh, Old Testament stories. So. What advice would you give to 
young professors, new professors at Lipscomb University, and also students coming out. Any advice you would, uh, when you look back, would you offer them and, and think that this is something that you wish you would have known coming out of Lipscomb or when you were beginning to teach at Lipscomb? That, that's, that's a very searching question. Uh, hmm. I would say in part, keep up with your profession. Don't decide because you finished a terminal degree, you know everything you need to know. Keep learning. Um, and, I, and I think the field of literature is just like any other field. It's constantly growing. Mm -hmm. uh, in my last years of teaching, I was teaching writers that hadn't even written anything when I started teaching. Mm -hmm. I didn't know they existed when I came out of school. And yet by the time I was getting ready to retire, I was spending a lot of time reading their works, reading about them, presenting their material. So I think it's very important to keep up with your learning. Uh, I think secondly, it's very important to keep up with changes that are occurring in people. You need to know what are high schools doing now. Mm -hmm. Um, I used to tell my freshmen every fall when they came in, you remember that college English course that your teacher always told you, be careful, you're going to be in it? You're in it now. Mm -hmm. So remember what she said. Uh, you know, for years, high school English teachers have used freshman English as, as their great bugbear or whatever it is. They're going to scare their students to death about it. So we had to follow through. We had, had to let some of that be real. But uh, keep, keep up with the students, know what they're learning, and where you can pick them up and, and then move, move forward. Um, I think keeping up would be my major concern, um, academically, uh, professionally, um, socially. Um, just know what's going on. Anything you would do different if you had a chance to start all over again? I'm sure there are lots of things I would do differently. Um, I remember preaching for a little rural church a good many years ago, in my, I was in my 20s. And we were having, my wife and I were having lunch that Sunday afternoon with a nice elderly couple. He was a former su superintendent of the public schools in that county. And he was reading the newspaper and I was grading papers. And he sat and watched me for a little bit and he said, um, don't bear down on that red pen so hard. Hmm. I said, sir, he said, don't bear down on that red pen so hard. In a few years, it won't matter at all. And I thought, yeah, he's right. No teacher should get a whole lot of glee out of marking something wrong. He just needs to try harder to make sure that he gets the things that are important taught. Good advice. And I thought oh, that was great advice, and I tried to follow it. Uh, don't get such satisfaction out of swiping that red pen across and what do, you, what do you foresee for the future of Lipscomb University for the next foreseeable future? I wish I knew. I, I could not have predicted what's happened, and I'm sure, I'm sure I can't predict what's, what's coming. But um, you know, I, I commend them for the progress they've made. Um, I'm proud of my degree. I'm proud to be a Lipscomb alumnus. I was editor of the 1958 Backlog and we dedicated it to Carol Ellis. And when I stood on the stage and read the dedication and called Carol up to receive his backlog, he just blew me away because Carol was such a great speech teacher. He had a repository of anecdotes that he could just draw on immediately. And he started out by talking about Daniel Webster, great senator being called upon to stand before the U.S. Supreme Court and defend his alma mater, Dartmouth College, that had been sued. And in his remarks to the Supreme Court, he said, and Carol quoted it, Dartmouth is a small school, but there are those of us who love her. Hmm. And I've always remembered that. I think that's a, that's a great assessment of your alma mater. May not be a great swirling university, Maybe in my day, it was a small school. We had 2,000 students in college. Mm -hmm. But there were those of us who loved her, and still do. Well, I once heard you quote Tennis, Tennyson. Uh, the, I think it goes something like, prayer has wrought more good in the world than more the world will ever know. 
more things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. That's from and Dr. Lloyd, opinion. you have wrought more good into Lipscomb University and the world than you will ever know of. Well, that's very kind. Chaucer describes his clerk of Oxenford as saying, and gladly would he learn and gladly teach. Hmm. And I, I kind of wanted that to be a, a motto for me. As long as I can be glad to learn and glad to teach, everything's going to be okay in my profession. That's right. There are too many teachers who are not glad to learn, and they're not glad to teach. It's a burden. Chaucer says that. Chaucer. Chaucer. Can Canterbury Tales. A literary life is a very interesting life. Oh, it a is. A life of ideas, a life of words. And you always have somebody to draw on. Mm -hmm. oh. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having we me. We appreciate you. Thank you very much, George. Wonderful.